Ah, this is the crisscross show. So this will be in two episodes today. Um, my first episode is going to be me breaking down the Concordia University Chicago women's basketball game and my thoughts on that. And the second episode will be my NBA ranking. So without further ado, let's get started with the Concordia University Chicago basketball game. Okay. So before I start, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. So I went to Concordia University Chicago for my undergraduate. I'm a huge Concordia sports fan. I I went to I basically watched all their games. Um, you know, have it had it on my phone, or I went to the live games uh, before the coronavirus pandemic happened. Um, so I went to almost all their games. I watched all their games. Or I heard about all their games, and. You know, I did this during my undergrad. I, I tried to go to games whenever I didn't have class. Um, football games, I didn't go to much. But basketball games is my favorite one. It's the main one. Again, I like basketball uh, more than anything. So, back in my undergrad, I was a little critical at, uh, towards the Concordia basketball team. And, and, and a lot of people thought it was me just disliking the team. But I was very, again, I was very, you know, I, I criticized just about every little thing because Concordia basketball got a lot of hype next to the football team. The football team gets the most hype and the basketball team is probably second and the baseball team becomes a close third. So, you know, when someone hypes something up, I, I'm going to be there to, you know, watch it very closely, just like all media people do. So... Concordia basketball during my undergrad wasn't so great. They had a two-win season at one point. Not so great, at least for the men's. The women's, they were pretty good during my undergrad years. So I'm proud to announce that I'm going to be um, analyzing, breaking down the games. And I'm going to try not to be as critiqueful um, towards the CUC games. I'm going to try to be honest and, you know... Um, having a good side to that side. And it may seem um, like, you know, I'm shouting down on them, but I'm not. So that's basically my background. I know during my undergrad years, I was a little critical towards that team, towards the basketball team, and a lot of people did not like that. Um, but that's just because I'm, I was a huge, passionate fan. I'm, I'm a big, passionate fan of the Concordia basketball team. And again, it's only because I want them to succeed in when they do win the conference championship, I want to be there. Um, and I know hopefully in the next couple of years it will happen. But anyways, I'm about to break down the women's basketball opener at Hope College. Okay, so I don't really know much about Concordia's basketball team just yet. I know that they're a pretty young team relatively. Uh, but I was listening to the commentators at Hope College, which to be honest, the Hope College commentators were amazing. Um, analyzed the game really, really well, talked about both teams and what they were missing and what they can improve on. Really, really great and positive. I love the commentary. Um, I typically don't like college sports commentary, especially, you know, D3 sports college commentary, because it's kind of, you know, just very by the book. It's it's scripted. It, it almost, they're just calling by the game. They try to be funny. They try to be Bill Walton in another, in another sense. Um, but anyway, listening to the commentary, and like I said, the commentary was very great. And I could, they did talk about Hope College, number one ranked team last year before the pandemic. They were 29-0, and 0, looked like they were going to win the national championship. So when I, when I heard this during the game, before in the pregame show, I knew Concordia was probably going to lose, right? Because Concordia is a team that has a young team, coaching their third year, trying to build a new system, trying to get in their recruits. So I knew Concordia was going to go into this game and probably lose. And they were also, Concordia, according to the commentary, was also missing seven of their players. And I think about two or three key players. So I knew it wasn't going to go great for Concordia. But anyways, going to the game. So Hope College has the number one ranked defense as of last year. Uh, returning basically everyone except for two players. So I knew Hope College is going to be pretty good. And again, I know... The season be, uh, begin typically begins in November, but they had to bring it to January because of the coronavirus pandemic. So during the game, the first couple of you know possessions, it looked pretty you know rusty. 
both teams looked really, really rusty. I mean, Hope College is a tall team. They're tall and lengthy. Um, when I think of when I think of Hope College versus Concordia, I literally thought about that one picture. Um, this one that I'm going to show right here, because they were just really, really tall. All of them really tall. Again, when you're ranked number one defensively in the Division three, and when you're 29 and 0, and you're in basketball, your team's going to be tall, lengthy, and very athletic. And that's exactly what Hope College looked like. So my expectations for CUC was, hey, I know they're going to lose, but you know, let's see what good comes out of this. And it was a lot of good things that came out of this as well. But anyways, so at the beginning of the game, Hope College grew to a 6-0 run. Um, then I think Concordia scored and made it 6-2. And then, you know, from there, they just, Hope College just went on a run. Again, tall, lengthy, got a lot of turnovers because a lot of sloppy passes from Concordia. And again, beginning of the season, so I understand the rust, missing a lot of key players, only having 10 players out of their like 18 or 19 actual players. Um, so I understood that. You know, it was going to be sloppy, at least for Concordia, mostly for Concordia. And it was. And again, Hope College was tall, lengthy. They got to the ball. They were, their hands everywhere. Their hands were everywhere. Their hands were moving. Um, so it looked really bad. And I think Concordia ended up with 40 turnovers. Because again, a tall, lengthy team, just like they said about the Los Angeles Lakers last year. Everyone said the Los Angeles Lakers, the thing that they got about them is that they're versatile. They're tall and long and They've got big arms and, you know, they can, you know, poke the ball away. And that's exactly how they ended up winning the championship and how they may had such an easy West Coast playoff run because they were tall and lengthy. So anyways, Hope College, very tall, very lengthy. Got a lot of turnovers, got a lot of fast break points. Concordia, very small, um, a smaller school than them. And, you know... You know, 11 turnovers in the first quarter is not that great, not a great recipe. I do think halftime was about, Concordia had about 17 or 12 to like 50 or 40 something from Hope College. So again, it wasn't a great first half for Concordia. And I, and I understood that and I'm trying to be as nice as possible because they were missing key players. First game of the season, Hope College, number one defensive team. And as well as 29-0 and 0 last year with returning Basically 90% of the roster. But one thing I did notice was Hope College kept half court pressing Concordia. So at, when, you know, the guard would bring up the ball, there was a Hope College player waiting for them to guard them. And Hope College played Concordia very tight, very aggressive. And one thing I noticed that the commentary was saying, and also I was thinking was do a high screen. Hope College keeps meeting you at half court. Do a high screen, high pick and roll. Get the screener to go down low. In the first couple of possessions, and again, being a very tall, lengthy team, covering up the, the I think it was the 5-4 point guard. Um, so it was kind of tough. Um, not a lot of screens, not a lot of motion. It was more just get it to half court and try to drive. I guess that was the plan. Um and that's one thing that I did not like to see was they kept doing it. They kept, I hope college kept running the same defense every single time. And there was nothing that could have been done. Um, it wasn't until the second half when they really started to kind of move the ball more. And again, when you're a small team and you're obviously out, when the other team's obviously taller than you, you've got to move the ball. You've got to get the defense run. You've got to get the defense shaky. And Concordia for the first couple of possessions were just kind of, you know, um, standing still. More of in awe that they're facing the number one team in the nation. So that's one thing that I'm going to criticize on. And I know it's only the first game missing seven players. I understand that. But you've got to move the ball and you've got to execute it a little bit better than what they did. And again, I understand. I'm going to say it again, but to a fault here. So Hope College is pretty good with their defense, um, sticking it to Concordia, basically sticking as close to them. Con again, they acknowledge the commentary acknowledged that Concordia's top score was their main focus, and that's how they were basically attacking them. They basically wanted everyone else to shoot and wanted everyone else 
to take the game over instead of obviously Concordia's top scorer from last year. So that's one thing from there. Obviously, one thing you can take, take away from Hope College, their average margin of victory last year, according to the commentators, was, about, was around 24 to 36 or something like that. So, you know, a, a team that's going to blow them out, um, one thing you can't take away, they're still great. I mean, that's that's the one thing about Hope College. Uh, you can't do much when you're a rebuilding team and you're facing, you know, a team that basically would have won the national championship if it wasn't for the pandemic. So anyways, there was a lot of things that I liked that Concordia did. So towards the end of the game, they started to kind of move the ball more, throw it into the paint, get fouls, get to the free throw line, get a rhythm going, stop the clock, get some quick, easy points. Hope College, I mean, you know, they're just a great school. Um, tall, lengthy, athletic, um, and, you know, nothing you could really done there. So some things to take away from Concordia. You're missing players. You can build on that. You're missing players. And, you know, again, it's rusty. It's the first game. I understand you're facing the number one team in the, in the in the nation. So, you know, there's a lot to build on there. You know, just kind of work on your work on moves, work on plays, work on defensive sets, what works, what doesn't work. A lot of positive stuff to build off of. It's not going to count towards your conference record. So that's okay. Um, some of my expectations... I will say to kind of end this for Concordia is to get into the playoffs, whether it's the last, the last or second to last seed, um, just so you get that experience. Um, and then obviously when your players are a year older and a, a, a year into the system, they know how to do this and you'll be a lot better. So that's my expectation for Concordia. And I think they can do it. They looked pretty good for the first four to five minutes um, against Hope. And towards the end of the game, looked a little looked a little shaky and a little tired again. A lot of their players were playing extended extended minutes, so um, you know, just some stuff to consider there. So that's one thing I will say about this is um, I am going to hopefully analyze every game, break down every game um, according to how I felt it went, and you know, some things that maybe they could have build they they could build on. Um, or something like that. So that's basically my analysis on the Concordia versus Hope College game. It was really, really great to see Concordia back on the court. I'm going to cheer for them. Um, I'm going to be their number one fan, but I'm also going to be honest on how I feel about them and what I feel that the, the, the coaches and also the players can do. So hopefully um, everyone from Concordia can appreciate this and hopefully we can um, have a great season, especially the women's basketball team. They look really promising today so hopefully they can have a great season and don't worry I'll be watching and I'll I'll be loving every minute of their wins and every minute of their baskets scored so anyways thanks for joining this far and I'll see you for the NBA top 10 teams NBA's top 10 teams right now again it's the top 10 teams that I believe will win or will be in the NBA finals if the season ended today so anyways, without further ado, the Portland Trailblazers moved down from 7th last week to number 10. So they are my top 10 team right now. Um, they are number 10. They are 2-2 two and two in their last four games. Um, they did lose to Indiana and to San Antonio. They also lost C.J. McCollum and Yusuf Nurkic for an extended time. Sorry. An extended time. So... Who knows how this, these next couple of weeks are, but they are going to stay on my top 10 because, again, they do still have notable wins in their schedule. Number nine, the Indiana Pacers. So they traded away Victor Oladipo in that big trade last week. Did get Karis LeVert, and Karis LeVert is out indefinitely for an extended, extended amount of time. Um, and they are, do have a two-game losing streak right now. They did lose to the Clippers and to Dallas, so, again, two good opponents so I'm not gonna hurt them that much they did go down five points because again I think this is where Indiana kind of tried Indiana starts to kind of you know show them true selves I mean everyone's into the season now there's a rhythm with teams now as you see Orlando the fairy tale story um, Atlanta the fairy tale story they kind of hit reality now and they're kind of showing their true selves that they're young and inexperienced so Indiana starting to show that. 
even though they've got a, a, a great team, a great build around. But, you know, Indiana will go to number nine. Number eight, the Brooklyn Nets. So they come back to my rankings after missing out last week. So the Brooklyn Nets with KD, Kyrie, and James Harden, which they officially played their first game together today, they're 0-1 against the Cleveland Cavaliers. Um, and we know how the Cleveland Cavaliers are when they don't have LeBron James on their roster. Not that great of a team. So I don't, I'm not so sure who played. I haven't seen the results of the game. I only saw the end result. And I know Kyrie played. So I'm assuming KD, James Harden, and Kyrie played. Uh, and they lost a pretty high-scoring game. I know they scored 135 and they lost to the Cavs. I think the Cavs scored like 140 or something like that. But anyways, they're 2-1 and one in their last three games. Looked great with James Harden and Kevin Durant. And again... Who's going to play defense? They gave away a lot of their good rim protectors like um, Jarrett Allen. So, you know, Karis LeVert, again, another good defender. What's going to happen with Brooklyn? Are they going to be a hot mess? Are they not going to be a hot mess? But they are fun to watch if you like people who play offense and no defense. So Brooklyn, not ranked last week, but they're back to number eight this week. Number seven, the Phoenix Suns. The Phoenix Suns are seven and five right now. A couple of big losses to Memphis, um, who is on a hot streak right now. Phoenix is kind of hitting reality. They're 7-5, and five, you know, kind of, you know, showing themselves, mid, you know, early mid-season stretch where they kind of, you know, the season starts to catch up to them. They looked great at the beginning. Now they're starting to kind of really realize that, oh, teams are catching up. So well, it's interesting to see Phoenix in these next two weeks and how they will respond to these couple of losses that they've had so far so phoenix will go down to seven number six the memphis grizzlies the memphis grizzlies are riding on a five game win streak notable wins against the philadelphia 76ers phoenix and brooklyn last week i think so they are playing better um memphis with john morant coming back they're looking a little bit better five game win streak i don't know exactly the record right now but I will know in a little bit. So Memphis will take the sixth spot. And they weren't ranked at all, I don't think, at all this season. And this is their first ranking of the year. So the top the top five, the, the bottom five teams, um, Portland at 10, Indiana at 9, Brooklyn at 8, Phoenix at 7, Memphis at 6. Up next is the top five teams. Right, so the top five teams are always a, a little tough for me to kind of decide because, again, they could go either or. Um, but for the most part, the top five will stay the same. So anyways, coming in at number five, the Milwaukee Bucks. They moved from six to five this week um, because they have a nine and five record. They did lose to Brooklyn with James Harden and Kevin Durant playing their, I think their what, first or second game together. Um, so again, Kevin Durant and James Harden were in their honeymoon stage, so they play great. We'd got to see again. But anyways, the Memphis Grizzlies, uh, Memphis Grizzlies, sorry. The Milwaukee Bucks are 9-5, and five, slowly getting the rhythm back again after a slow start. And again, I, I'll say this a million times over and over. Teams like Orlando, Atlanta start the season off hot, and the media, you know, is in love with that story. And then, you know, Milwaukee, everyone says, oh, Milwaukee is the time to trade this and that. And then they go back to their regular selves and start winning games. And obviously, we know who the top teams are. So Milwaukee will crack number five for me this week. Number four, the Utah Jazz. They are riding a six-game win streak. They're playing really, really great basketball. Um, I do think they did have a good win against the Pelicans yesterday. A very convincing win against a good Pelicans team. So Utah's catching up. Again, slow start for them. But a veteran team catching back up. It took a while to get them into the, the season, but a six-game win streak. They're sitting at 10-4 and four and in fourth place in my rankings. Number three, the Los Angeles Clippers. Now, I wanted to move them up to number two and switch them to Philadelphia, but I decided to keep it that way because they are riding a four-game win streak against some pretty decent opponents. Playing Again, playing at home, playing in the West Coast, not having left the East not le not having left to the East Coast yet. So I'm going to wait on that. They are going to stay at number three because, again, I need to see a little bit more from the LA Clippers. I need to see Kawhi and Paul George play a little bit more to kind of be convinced a little bit more. Their pieces like Luke Kennard 
and Batum are pretty great. Um, so far, gelling really, really well with a 10-4 and four record. Number two, the Philadelphia 76ers. They are 10-5. and five. They're 3-1 and one in their last game, our uh, last couple games. Um, they did have a good win against Boston tonight with um, Joel Embiid scoring 42 points. So again, if Philadelphia continues to play like this and they don't start this drama show like they had the last couple of years, then they'll be favorites in the East. Currently my favorites in the East because again, Joel Embiid looks in shape. Ben Simmons playing pretty good. Doc Rivers isn't forcing him to take threes. He's taking threes when he feels comfortable. And that's what we want. We want our players to feel comfortable when they take their jump shots. We don't. I feel like we're trying to give Ben Simmons or force Ben Simmons into something that he's not comfortable with yet. So that's what I feel is really great what Doc Rivers is doing. He's saying we're going to let Ben Simmons just kind of get into his game, play his game. And if he wants to shoot a three or two, if he wants to shoot a three, maybe once or twice a game, we're fine with that. But we're not going to require him because right now we're winning. So I like what Philadelphia is doing right now, sitting at a 10-5 and five record and 3-1 and one in their last games, and they are number two. Number one, again, of course, the LA Lakers. They did lose their last game to the Warriors, but again, they got lazy, veteran team, Monday night game. You just tend to lose it, and I'm going to cut them some slack, but I'm really not going to cut them some slack. It was an embarrassing loss. LeBron and AD combined for, I think it was 12-32. and 32. That can't happen. AD hasn't shown up at all this year, and they're 11-4. and four. So just imagine when AD starts to show up, they're going to be amazing. So they're sitting at 11-4, best record in the West, best record in the league, and playing pretty, pretty well for a team that's coasting right now. Um, I consider them coasting because, again, LeBron's taking random shots every once in a while. AD has an average 20 points in a couple of games. So um, the LA Lakers have a tough seven-game East Coast road trip. So we're going to see a little bit more in the next couple of weeks. Maybe they might be dethroned. But right now, they've held the number one spot for four weeks in a row for my ranking. So there are my rankings. Um, I did have a um, an honorable mention team, the San Antonio Spurs. They are on like a four-game win streak, four or five-game win streak. So San Antonio's also playing really, really great, but they didn't crack my top 10. So again, my top 10, number 10, Portland, number 9, Indiana, number 8, Brooklyn, number 7, Phoenix, number 6, Memphis, number 5, Milwaukee, number 4, Utah, number 3, the Clippers, number 2, the Philadelphia 76ers, and number one, the LA Lakers. So hopefully you enjoyed those top 10 rankings. I'll be back next week with my um, last rankings for January. So there you go. Enjoy. Let me know what you think on the comment section below.